So Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. We just ask that he would um, reveal Christ as, he is, as, as Jesus told us he would. And uh, may all glory go to you. And may people feel your presence and recognize the majesty and glory of Jesus. Amen. So Dr. Craig Keener, can you just give me a summary of who and what Jesus Christ is? Wow, everything. <laughs> um, Colossians tells us that he's going to be the, uh, in Ephesians, they tell us he's going to be the summing up of all things. So everything is that the Father created was through Christ and for Christ and for, for his honor, uh, because the Father loves the Son so much and the Son loves the Father so much. And so, um, Everything has its purpose and its place only in relation to Christ. And he's the one who, who reconciled us to God. We, we had broken that relationship with God through our sin. But Jesus and his great love for us and his great love for the Father gave himself to bring us back into relationship with God. And how foolish it would be for somebody not to embrace that great gift that he's he's made available to us at such a great cost of his own death. In Daniel chapter 7, you have this, um, this vision that Daniel has of these four beasts. And then after the beasts, you have something that instead of looking like a beast, it's described as one like a son of man. And each of these beasts represents a different empire, a different king and, and their kingdom. The Son of Man also represents an empire, but this is the kingdom of God. Uh, and, and Daniel's explicit about this. This is the kingdom of God, also the king in the kingdom of God. And so he's one with the, those who are called the saints of the Most High. So he's, he's united with them. He's one like a Son of Man. So it, it describes him in terms of his humanity in contrast to the beastly empires. And it also says, uh, well, it talks about the suffering of the saints. So his, his union with them means he's going to suffer with them. And it also says that all the nations worship him, which is language that's only, only used for God. So here is one who's both God and human. Who's, who's the one who brings together so that God's kingdom can be among us. People in Jesus' day were expecting a powerful king to come and overthrow Rome. But instead, Jesus came in the day of the fourth of Daniel's kingdoms and suffered with the saints of the Most High under Rome, because Rome was small fries. He didn't come to overthrow just Rome. He came to defeat sin and death. And of course, the, the consummation of his kingdom will be the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our God and of his Messiah. But Jesus came the first time to get the world ready, because otherwise, when he does away with all, all wickedness, we would have all been toast, but he came first to get us ready, those of us who are willing to, to be his followers. That's beautiful. He's called Christ, yeah. Yes. What, what does this word mean to you? The, the Greek word Christos is, which, you know, when Greeks thought of it, they thought of anointed, but, you know, they anointed people just, you know, as part of their hygiene regularly. They, they wouldn't necessarily understand what it meant, but it was a direct translation of the Hebrew Mashiach, anointed one, which was used especially for the anointed king. Like Saul was anointed as king. David was anointed as king. The Psalms often, uh, the Greek translation of the Psalms often speak of the Christos uh, being, being the anointed Davidic ruler. And so the ultimate Davidic ruler. Now, you have that in Isaiah chapter 11, Isaiah chapter 9, not with the title Messiah, 
uh, although you do have that elsewhere, but um, you have it in, in Isaiah 9 with this ultimate Davidic ruler where he says, he will be called the mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the everlasting Father. And over the throne of David and his kingdom, he will reign forever. So again, bringing together his, his deity and his humanity, as, as Paul says, in defining the gospel in Romans 1, 1 to 4, he says, you know, according to the scriptures inspired through the prophets, Jesus came according to the flesh as descendant of David, and then by, by the power of the spirit of holiness, he, being raised from the dead, God declared him to be his, his son. So, and, and the sonship also, like in the Psalms, uh, Psalm 2, God says to the Davidic king, you are my son, today I've begotten you. And that was, that was a title given at the enthronement. So even though Jesus was already God's son in the New Testament, uh, that psalm is applied to Jesus in the New Testament in Hebrews 1 in Acts 13 for his enthronement, his exaltation, his resurrection and, and enthronement. And, of course, Israel was called God's son. There's a, a general sense in which humanity made in God's image or called his children like Acts 17, 28. Uh, so that's a, that's a general sense. But um, where it's used specifically for the Son of God, that would be the ultimate Davidic king. And, and yet, in the Gospels, it's used is even more than that. Just as Christ, just as messianic expectations were redefined, by Jesus' identity, by by whom he revealed, who he revealed himself to be, in the same way, um, so also Jesus is God's Son. You see this intimacy between the Father and the Son. Uh, we can also think of it in terms, you know, a father and a son share some of the same uh, genetic material. You know, uh, Jesus being holy, the Father's Son spiritually speaking, has wholly his DNA. So you're, you're talking about, you know, they're both both divine. But but Jesus as, as the, the Son of God, I mean, you see his intimacy with the Father. It's talked about in the Gospel of John over and over again. It becomes a model for our relationship with, with him, his relationship with the Father. As he says in 10, 14, and 15, my sheep know me even as I know the Father, and the Father knows me. But also in, in Matthew 11 and the parallel passage in Luke 10, Jesus is praying to the Father and says, nobody knows the Father except the Son, and to whomever the Son will, will reveal him. So it speaks to the intimacy of their relationship. And in Mark 14, 38, Jesus uses special wording that that you know he um, taught his followers to use it's in Romans 8 and Galatians 4 but in in Mark 1438 Jesus is praying to the Father as he's facing the cross you know this is his mission but if there was some other way that it could be accomplished other than going through the cross, that would be great. I mean, he, he's he's on the verge of the worst suffering, e even on a purely human level. Romans had perfected crucifixion over centuries of time to make it as exquisitely painful a death as possible. And when they pound the nails through the hands, um, and there's a, there's a special nerve there. The pain is so intense that when people were injured there during World War I, they would actually amputate their hands so they wouldn't die from shock from the pain. Wow. So, um, and, and sometimes it would take people a few days to die from, from shock on the cross. But um, he's, he's getting ready to face this. And he says, Abba, Father. Mm -hmm. And Abba, 
was an intimate expression. Some some people have said it only children would say that. That's that's not true. I mean, it's not just little children who'd say it, but it's you know adults could also say it. But it was a a term of of special intimacy and trust, and it's it's barely ever used for God in ancient Jewish literature. Never, so far as I know, is it used in a prayer. Some people have disputed that, but I mean, the evidence we have is later, and it's not in the prayer. <laughs> so um, often Jewish people called addressed God as Father. That wasn't surprising, but here we see Jesus at his most vulnerable and expressing his intimacy with the Father. And yet, even with this intimacy, he says, Father, nevertheless, now please take this cup from me. You know, it's the same cup, James and John, he said to them, unless you drink this cup, my cup, and baptize with my baptism, you know, you're not ready for the for the honor. Uh, and also, uh, you know, the, the cup of the covenant in my blood, Jesus speaks about. But when he says, take this cup from me, nevertheless, not my will. But your will be done. His intense love for his father expressed in his intense obedience and faithfulness. And as much as the father loved the son, though, for the sake of our salvation. Sometimes when God says no, it's for our good. Like when Jesus said no to James and John. <laughs> Sometimes it's for others' good. And in this case, just like Jesus says, you know, nobody can, can, you can't give up the whole world to save your own soul or save your life. But Jesus could give up his life to save the whole world. And for the world's sake, the Father said no. And Jesus went to the cross and bore our pain and bore our sin the consequences of our sin. And so we see his heart of love and oh. faithfulness. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's beautiful. It moves my heart. In your personal life, he, he, he's won your heart, huh? You know, when I was when I was an atheist uh, before my conversion, I I thought, you know, there's no way we can have immortality. There's no way we can have life after death. We're just dust. You know, we're, there's no there's no hope. There's no meaning unless there would be somebody infinite. Wow, who would also happen to be caring enough for us little finite beings, that he would give us life. But I was like, that's the best of all possible worlds. But man, that's just too good to be true. And then when some people brought me the gospel, you know, it wasn't just their words. The Holy Spirit was there. And the Holy Spirit... Um, God was present. And there was no way I could deny it. He came to me. Wow. I didn't have any claim on him. I didn't even grow up in a in a Christian family. Although I had Christian relatives who were praying for me, I found out later, but I didn't grow up in an immediately Christian family. There was nothing I could have done that would have merited his favor. But so loving, he's so loving. He reached out to me. And he didn't just reach out to me. He paid the ultimate price to make me his, to make us all his. We don't want to miss, miss his heart towards us. As, as Paul says in Galatians 2.20, he loved me mm. and gave himself for me. Nobody like him. Absolutely. It's, Making us more like him. And and Ephesians 2, talking about the revelation of his love through the ages of eternity, 
Can you hear that in the background? I can't really hear it. Okay, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I have my window open, but okay. So throughout all the ages of eternity, we will be getting to know the depths of his love in the cross more and more deeply because what he gave was of infinite value. And so for all of eternity, we'll be exploring that love ever more deeply. You know, the end of John, um, I believe it's the end of John 17, when Jesus is praying, he, he uses this phrase at the end. He says, um, this is the NIV, I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Is this a continuous revealing for the believer? It sounds continuous. I mean, in the context of of John 15 with the abiding in him, and, you know, if we keep his commandments, he'll love us. He already loves us. So it sounds like, you know, the, we'll, we'll go deeper and deeper. And, and also in 1723, he says that we know that the world may know that you, Father, have loved them even as <laughs> you've loved me. It, it's the word kathos, uh, which was used earlier. I, I mentioned it in John 10, 11, and 12. Just as, in the same way as. How marvelous is God's love, as First John also says. Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. Such amazing, amazing love. Absolutely. If there are people watching this, uh, I'm going to post it up later. And you could look into their eyes as believers, fellow believers in Christ. If you could look at them and encourage them with something, speak into the, the mother who's doing dishes or the father who's a blue collar worker, or if you could say something to the Christians out there, what would you look into the camera and say? He loves you so much. You were so precious to him. He gave everything for you. He has a purpose for you. He cares about your life. He cares about the details in your life. Even when you're going through hard times, look, he came, he shared that with us in the cross and even before the cross. Even when we're going through hard times, that's not a sign that God doesn't love us. Hebrews chapter 12, in fact, says that you know, whom God loves, he, he'll, he'll work on us to, to make us more fruitful. Also John 15. So be encouraged by who you are in God's sight, beloved by your heavenly Father in Christ, and watch what he may do in and through you. Oh my gosh, it's such a tenderness and a gentleness in your in your heart and it just comes out in your voice. Let's say there's some people watching right now and they love to study the scriptures. Mm -hmm. uh, what what piece of advice would you give to someone who just loves to read the word but you want to help them get the most out of it? What would you say to them? If they study it a lot, they they may already know this, but um, as you immerse yourself in it, don't just jump from this verse to that verse. The way God inspired it, he inspired it in a context. So we're going to hear the voice of the Spirit most clearly when we hear it in context. Of course, God can speak through Scripture out of context. He can speak through anything he wants to. Um, but if we want to hear the way God inspired it, and especially if we want to communicate it that way, we want to hear it in context. When I was a young Christian, I I, I was um, already signed up for Latin 
uh, before my conversion. And, and it's come in handy in my case. But so I was studying, uh, I was supposed to be translating Caesar's Gallic War. And on my way home from Latin class, I was like, I don't want to study Caesar's Gallic War. I just want to read the Bible. So I flipped open the Bible, stuck my finger down. It said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and the God what's God's. Now, okay, God got my attention for that. But just imagine I went around to all the churches and said, God told me that you all should study, mm. translate Caesar. <laughs> well, that's not the meaning of the text, you know. So, so to immerse ourselves in what it says in context and and not to and also not to miss the forest for the trees to catch the big picture to catch god's heart there and how god relates to people and how god relates to his own children and you know even even in exodus uh, 33 and 34, as he's giving the law again to Moses. There are certain passages that give us like a heart, uh, a hermeneutical center for reading the rest, like like Jesus in Matthew 12, 7, and uh, Matthew 9, 13 says how God desires mercy more than sacrifice. It, or or uh, in, in Mark chapter 10, where where Jesus says, Moses said this because of the hardness of your heart, but from the beginning, this was God's intent. You know, that there, there's certain places in Scripture where it gives you a summary or just, you know, pulls it together. So we can learn from all of Scripture, but there are these certain places that kind of give us a hermeneutical grid or an interpretive foundation and one of those is Exodus 33 and 34, because it just tells us what God is like. So God is mad at his people because they have really blown it multiple times. And now, you know, people say God doesn't get mad. Well, yeah, he does. <laughs> uh, but the mad, the, the anger is also, it's the flip side of his love because he knows what's best for us. And man, his people were really messing up. And and also, if you have somebody who's hurting somebody you love, that's also a cause for you know, intervening. But in Exodus 33 and 34, Moses says, God, I, you know, please dwell with us. And God says, Moses, you know, they messed up, but you're my friend. And so Moses says, God, if I'm your friend, then I ask you one thing show me your glory. <laughs> And God says, you can't see all my glory, but I'll show you part of my glory, because nobody can see all my glory and live. So he reveals part of his glory to Moses. And as the Lord, he says, I'll, I'll make my goodness pass before you. I think it's 33, 18. And then in 34, 5 and 6, as the Lord passes before Moses, the Lord says, the Lord, the Lord, gracious and merciful the Lord who visits the iniquity of the parents and the children of the third and fourth generation, but whose faithful love and his reliability, his um, chesed the emet, there's all sorts of ways to translate it, his, it, but you could translate it as grace and his, his truth, maybe. His, his, his love and his, his faithfulness are not just to the third and fourth generation, like his discipline but to the thousandth generation, so much greater is his mercy than his anger. And, and he uses that language, the Lord abounding in covenant love and covenant faithfulness, which could be translated full of grace and truth. So when the word comes maybe 1,300 years later, depending on when you date, you know, the Exodus, which is debated. But anyway, in John 1, 14 through 18, this time, God doesn't give his word on tablets of stone, but this time the word becomes flesh. And, and John says, we beheld his glory, well, just like Moses did. We beheld his glory. And he says, this glory was full of grace and truth. And, and then Moses, after God revealed his character to Moses, Moses says, God, please dwell with us, since that's the way you are. 
And God said to Moses, I will. Well, the word became flesh and dwelled among us. And that word dwelling, uh, literally it means he tabernacled among us. You know, it's an allusion back again to Exodus. Tabernacled among us. We beheld his glory full of grace and truth. The law was given through Moses, John 1, 17. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Well, grace and truth were already there with Moses. Ah, but Moses could only see part of God's glory. Now we see the fullness. John 1, 18. No one has beheld God at any time. Well, just like he said to Moses. But then he goes on to say, but the one and only God, who is in the bosom of the Father, has made him known. And the, the word for, for make known there, uh, exegesita, it, it means to fully expound, to declare the, the nature and character of, so that Jesus could stand before his disciples and say, the one who has seen me has seen the Father. And you see how Jesus is glorified in the, in the gospel. Um, as he reveals his glory, full of grace and truth. He does these signs like turning water into wine into 11. But ultimately, you see it in chapter 12, where he says, now the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground, it remains alone. But if it, if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. The Son of Man was glorified especially in the cross, because it's in the cross where we see the fullness of grace and truth. Moses could see only part of God's glory. Someday there'll be the full cosmic spectacle of fireworks, even more than what Moses saw. But if we really want to see like the goodness that passed before Moses, if we really want to see the fullness of grace and truth of which Moses got just a sample, we look at the cross. Mm. Because that's where we see the heart of God. As we humans were pounding the nails in his hands, declaring our hatred for God, he was saying, I love you. I love you. I love you. Oh, man. I don't know if you how it feels over there, but I just feel such a sense of the presence of the Lord. I feel such a sense of, um, is that how, is this, when you teach, you just, it just begins to manifest like this. I, I actually am not a student in my classes, but <laughs> I, <laughs> but I, I trust that that's what the Lord does. Yeah. When you, when you speak of him, like this, and you're you're watching the revelation of him in the scriptures and expounding upon it. Do you sense like he he responds to it in some way? Yeah. Would you pray for me, and would you pray for those that that are watching, and then then we could be be done. But I'd love it if you pray for us. Father, thank you. Thank you so much for sending your son Jesus to us. And thank you for my brother's sensitivity to your spirit and the desire for people to, to know you intimately. Lord, we pray that you will open our ears to hear your voice, to know your heart, to walk in your ways. Make us more and more into the image of your son. Jesus Christ, because that's what it's all about, from beginning to end, before the foundation of the world, until all the ages of eternity. The Lamb of God, who was slain for us, oh, that is your point. And how can we, how can we not praise you? How can we not thank you? You are holy. And in your holiness, we could never have reached you. You reached us. You set us apart for yourself. And so 
We give you glory. We pray you'll make us what you've called us to be. And you will always plant your word deep in our hearts and minds. Lord, as it, as it is written with the new covenant, that you would write your loss in our hearts. Thank you that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has freed us from the law of sin and death. And that you have chosen to be revealed in us. And as your spirit is at work in us as a down payment of the future age, we, we are the people who really belong to the future age. And you have chosen to reveal some of that future glory in these earthen vessels, these, these clay pots. Oh, Lord, we are but clay pots. But how great is your glory. Yes. And we pray that your glory may fill the earth. We know it will. We, we look to you for your glory to, to fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. We ask you this, God, our Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen.